Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Uh, this is part of the Scubani e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. Scubana is a software platform to manage your entire e-commerce operation. Today, we have Eitan Wiener. He's co-founder and COO of Quantum Networks. Founded with Ari Zoldan and Jonathan Goldman, they grew from zero to 30 million in sales in just under four years. They sell items such as wireless routers, signal boosters, hard drives, and much more. And it all started with Aton and two friends in a cubicle. Aton, thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. Straight from New York. You know, and I have a fun fact that's really interesting about you. And we're going to talk about, you know, you're really good. And I have a long list of about advanced analytics, marketing, what you guys do with tech support, partnerships, you know, challenges. But you started off and you went to dental school. Yeah. Why? Why? Yeah. Um, my dad's a doctor. My uncle's a doctor. Most of my friends are doctors. Yeah. I was going to be a doctor. And then I was like, maybe I'll be a dentist, which was probably smarter based on the current healthcare situation. Right. Um, and then I was like, okay. So, and I had pretty good grades. And I went to dental school. Um, I did very well on the academic side, but all the laboratory, like tedious, nitty gritty millimeter work kind of yeah. made me a little uh, crazy. Cuckoo. Yeah. And I had like a baby on the way and I wasn't sure what to do. And it was like, you know, a lot of investment, but I just really wasn't happy and I didn't want to continue that. Um, did you mind end up have, finishing? Have, or? It happened to be not the greatest school. I think if I would have gone somewhere else, they'd probably push me through. Yeah. So it wasn't it wasn't the best uh, support system. But yeah. I was like, you know what? Let me try something else. And I got into marketing, and then the rest is uh, yeah. history. But um, I, I do have a, a science background. Okay. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting, actually. And so yeah. we'll we'll talk about when that first started in the cubicle. But first, um, what's working? What should what's a must for sellers to boost sales? You guys drive a lot of sales. Um, what should people start to think about and do that you're doing? Um, it's funny. I went to a lot of trade shows recently, and the whole thing now is omni-channel. Yeah. Omni-channel, multi-channel. So omni-channel being like different platforms, mm-hmm. and multi-channel being um, different marketplaces. Mm-hmm. So when you have a site, you have to have a mobile site, and you have to have an iPad-friendly site, whether it's responsive whether it's um, adaptive or you mm-hmm. have a custom site, most purchases now or a lot are made on mobile devices. Yeah. And it's like the hottest thing, the payment side of it, et cetera. So that's huge. Yeah. Because people are starting to use their phones more than their computers, a lot more. Yeah. To buy stuff. So streamlining that process, making it efficient and making the checkout efficient is key. Yeah. Um, and as far as multi channel, you know, the Amazons and Ebays of the world are hard to um, leave out. So there's a lot of conflict sometimes. Do you want to sell on these channels? You know, they violate certain pricing rules or they control the market or it's monopolistic. Mm. But there are ways to do it. You kind of have to play with it. Um, it's usually for the good. You could do a lot of sales. Yeah. Um, sometimes it hurts the brand. But if you do it right, and we're pretty good at that, and the vendors that we carry... Um, it could increase sales a lot. So yeah. putting the brands that we represent or manufacture on our website um, as well as the other channels and in all the different formats for different uh, renderings for different devices is yeah. key to really get out there. Um, you have to be everywhere on the web, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So what channel should people be thinking about? Um you know, our website was very, very successful at the beginning for different reasons, which we can go into. Yeah. But then we kind of got into the whole Amazon world, and that kind of really grew our business a lot. Yeah. The problem with that is a lot of times you're not so sure how much money you're making with all the fees and right. associated uh, issues. Yeah. And you also kind of lose your own brand name and customer. So yeah. if you sell... Um, cell phones on a website you have the brand you have your name you can 
contact the customer and own right. the customer. On Amazon, you can't really contact the customer. Right. And they take their fees. So you, yeah. you pay acquisition costs for your website as well. But if you have your own brand and your name, you really want that. And yeah. when these huge Amazons and Ebays take over online, you know, it's like number one and two and everyone else, it's very hard to build a website. So what we've done is, since we shifted a lot towards the marketplaces, we're shifting back now to build our own branded website mm -hmm. um, with certain features from learning experience to, to really make it uh, pop and, uh, and to sell. Yeah. But not abandoning the, the channels, but, you know, kind of diversifying mm -hmm. um, and going back to our roots. Yeah. Yeah, you realize you own that customer and you can follow up with them and they, you know, recognize you as the brand. Um, what was working early on with the web? You said the website early on was, yeah, was so really early big. On, yeah. Um, as I said, we're guys in a cubicle or I think you mentioned that in the intro. Yes, yes. So I started, I got into web marketing, like SEO and pay-per-click uh, with someone who I met. And then my partner, Ari, was working on the same floor. He has a telecom background. Um and he had sold several telecom companies and the most recent was an equipment company where they just started listing like refurbished and recertified products online on ebay and they built customer base from it right. carrier base from it he had sold those companies and he wanted to do the next best thing which was 4g wimax wireless so we kind of got into that and we basically made a website where we listed every single 4g wimax or lt yeah. product before it was kind of that prevalent right. so I think I saw it. it's like going YMAX or yeah that... yeah we have some blogs and media sites that we still use yeah so YMAX was one technology that's print and clear wire deployed and then there was LTE which is what people use now AT and T and Verizon as you know yeah and you know it was very early in its in its uh, it was in its infancy so people would call from Africa and hmm. liberal countries and and want certain products and a lot of times it would just be not realistic because of all these different licensing issues and this and that. Mm. That said, we did close several very large deals. So we have a large network in Panama, yeah. and, um, in the Virgin Islands, and in Africa. Um, so it was a good business, but it was like very long sales cycle, uh, sometimes years. So really? it was a lot of months. So it didn't really pay the bills, but it was something. Yeah. So we're like, we need to figure something that's more consistent. And that was really when e-commerce was kind of taking off. So we f started to sell stuff, but we didn't want to sell things that were such commodities like cell phones. So you're competing as everyone else, in other words. Right. So we, we wanted to find a niche product. So something that has a certain price point, yeah. a certain margin. There's the sales assist model where you need to kind of explain to someone what it is and help them. So right. we're like replacing retail online. Right. So they call up, they ask a couple of questions. Initially, it was like cellular boosters, people who don't have cell coverage for their um, home or office. They don't even realize, which is part of the product uh, secret. Like, you tell someone a product exists, they don't even know about it, and it helps them so much. It's a pretty easy sell, right. despite the price. So we can charge a premium. We don't have to compete on price. We help them, and we find them the right solution. And instead of, you know, they're paying thousands of dollars for their cell bill or they need it for emergency, now they have a booster or amplifier for their home. Right. So quickly, because of that model and some SEO and strategic online moves, we were selling a lot of this stuff. We became like yeah. the biggest sellers of a lot of these smaller companies. And then we continued to find more of that that type of genre product. Yeah. Um, we diversified a little more into just regular consumer electronics, but most of the stuff we sell has like a little edge to it or a twist. It's usually not something. Uh, it's a little major. more niche or higher you end. Buy it like in a Best Buy or uh, a Target. So, I mean, we sell storage and surveillance, but it's usually like on the higher end side or the studio side or something that's a little different. Yeah. So there's pricing, good margin, and there's a program where there's some kind of value add for us that makes it make sense. But when we in turn offer the value add to the vendor, so we're not just some other guy online selling their stuff. We're providing a service we're doing installation right we're monitoring the brand and the the channel strategy yeah yeah i want to talk about that later on too about the tech support and how tech support helps drive sale more sales for you um but back to what's interesting is talk about what was working with seo and online because what's interesting is people like you said don't even know there's something out there so how do you get those customers through you know, the online, obviously you're an expert in online marketing. T 
to who didn't know this even existed to actually coming to your site and, and getting a product? That's a good question. Um, I think people were searching in this case, Cellular Boost is a good example because that's like how I kind of honed a lot of the method. Right. So people didn't have coverage. So you Google like, what do I do? Right. You know, I need coverage in my house. You right. know? And build a cell tower in your basement. Right. This is before femtocells and the carriers weren't really so on board. Because for the carrier to say, like, you have bad cell coverage is kind of admitting that their coverage they, isn't good. They, they, so they didn't really like boosters. They went through a whole FCC process, which is a whole upper separate discussion. But we would post a lot of content about it. So anytime I was just speaking to my customer service team about this. When you get questions from customers, it's important to document it. It's mm. important to yeah. tra transcribe it almost. And put it on Q and A's in the blog. So if someone searches, you know, like in your case, you know how to get video podcasts out there, right? And your blog comes up, it's very targeted. So Google is getting better at that. So right. if someone searches, you know, how do I get the right cell amplifier for a four thousand square warehouse in Atlanta? And I had that content you usually come up for the long tail of search. Mm, yeah. So long tail cumulatively is much shorter than the short tail. Someone searching cell amplifier. So sometimes people don't even know it exists. They just say, I need coverage or those keywords like coverage, reception, blah, blah, yeah. blah. Yeah. And then when it became a little more popular, which it is now, uh, there's these companies that I used to sell. They're actually even the best by now. Like I would never think they would be. They were much more niche and uh, um, specific. Now they're more like they're funded by VCs and they're, they're very uh, out there. But um, people search their brand names. People search the solution and we would come up with different blog posts and videos mm -hmm. and custom landing pages and AdWord campaigns right. just to target that base. And then we built a lot of repeat customers from that, yeah. which I said was the value of the website. So whenever they needed a solution, if they were an installer or for a home or for a friend, they'd come back and that's really how we um, did that. And we applied the same method to other products and solutions. Yeah. Yeah. So you're doing content marketing before it was called content marketing. Probably. Um, I mean, th that's when they told me when I started, like, content is king. Right. At that time, people were doing, like, spammy links and all this other stuff that was, like, yeah. driving Google. And whenever the Google changed the algorithm, people would get, like, penalized. So right. we didn't usually have this problem. I think nowadays SEO is very hard to do. It's almost like... It's almost like... Um, um, what's the word? I wouldn't say untrue. It's almost... Um, like a myth or something? Yeah, because you used to try to find things to kind of fool a search engine or a robot or Google. But in reality, they're just getting better. The algorithm is getting smarter. Semantics yeah. and realizing right. what's going on. So no, but I like your method. I mean, your method of basically document all questions and, uh, hey, document all questions and write them down because this is the exact words and verbiage people are using and then put them in their Q&A or blog post and answer them and you become the expert. Yeah, I actually had a friend. He would um, he was starting a business where he would record all the receptionist calls and transliterate it, the content. Yeah. So you'd come for that. Um, yeah. I'm not sure what happened to that, but um, <laughs> that's the idea. That's smart, yeah. And yeah, that, that was one of the ways we, we started. And again, now it's much harder, but by continuing doing content, um, you can thrive. So one of the things yeah. we're doing now is um, uh, video content. Mm. So since retail is kind of going away, you want to bring that retail experience to the web. Yeah. So we partnered with uh, a company that does a lot of video-based marketing. Mm. So every product that we have on our new website will be a video, but it won't be... Sometimes it'll be a custom video from the vendor, but the beauty of a lot of the software and the process is that it'll pull from existing content. So if I'm selling, let's say, a Netgear switch or router, I don't have to really do a review on that because there's a lot of existing content. Right. So it'll pull from YouTube, it'll pull from iTunes, I see. and we could serve up the best video. Yeah. And aside from the video being on our product page, we'll also have a .tv. So if the site's Jeremy.tv you'll have all your product videos and then people will click there and it'll take them to the actual checkout page. Yeah. And the conversion is almost 60, 70% higher. Really? Because they're getting relevant content, video content of what they want to buy, explaining yeah. it to them. Almost like a customer service person explaining what this is to you. Right. Um, 
So with some of the software that we're building and, and, and collaborating with, we've seen a really great conversions and it's a real big value added for the vendors. Um, I think that's like the next level of SEO and, and, and the web, where it's yeah. like a virtual shopping experience. Um, so in the, the beginning, Eitan, do you pull in certain things that you know are good or is it built now that to automatically pull in certain videos? I'm just curious if there's certain content that you look for that you want that you find works better to be on that page that's a good question so the beauty of the software is that based on the sales conversions you could see which video did better mm. let's say you want to buy um tv and i show you one well I don't sell tvs but let's say you want to buy uh i don't know a whatever router, router yeah and you see someone and then we work we're working with a vendor um, and they give us video content. Yeah. We pull some content from public content from YouTube or Dailymotion, and we pull some content from some guy in his basement doing a review. Right. Sometimes that will convert better because it's a real it's unbiased review yeah. unboxing. But the beauty of the software is we could tell which does best because we see what converts and what doesn't. Right. Yeah. And the real value of that is we could often go back to the vendor and tell them, hey, this video converted... Right. Um, better than the other one. And they're like, thanks for telling me because I spent $5 million on video and I have no <laughs> idea of right. the ROI, return on investment, wow. because I have no audience. There's no like rating, like a TV rating. It's all based on experience. Right, so right. it's a really cool win-win for the vendor and us to promote products in this new yeah. age way. And that's one of the things we're really working hard on now. Yeah, so what have you, what surprised you? What's worked that you've seen with conversions in certain sales videos? Um, the unboxings are good with lots of detailed explanations and descriptions. Mm -hmm. Um, it kind of depends. I mean, it depends on the sector. So I'm more on like electronics type stuff. And right. It's like apparel and clothing. Yeah. And no. Like, yeah. We're, disclaimer is this is your no, expertise. No, I know. Yeah. But I'm saying if it's apparel, like I mean, I know other e-commerce sectors. Yeah. You know, a lot of it's about image and brand, or if it's luxury. You know, sometimes a video with someone on a first-class flight you know holding it is is appealing to the person right right but if it's a router sometimes it has to be a very detailed explanation <laughs> right or to show someone like hey this is really not so hard to use yeah. so it really depends on the product yeah some of the products we sell are like gadgety kickstarter up-and-coming companies where mm -hmm. you want to sell like the idea and the image and some are just like straight up hardware where you want to say what it does and yeah. how and what so it really depends yeah but What's one that, that surprised you? That being you? said, there's, yeah. there's, yeah, there's metrics. What surprised me as far as conversion? Yeah. You're like, why did this even convert? You know, maybe it's an unboxing. Yeah, it's I mean, like... there's, there's a lot of – the problem on the web nowadays is that the data is very fragmented. So when you get content for a product, whether you get it from the manufacturer or you mm -hmm. write your own content or you get it from an aggregator or a distributor of the product, everyone seems to have the same content on their website, mm. which is also not so good for search, but it's just the reality. Right. So what happens is it gets very um, um, crowded, fr fragmented, and yeah. often incorrect. So you have listings on Amazon or on websites that don't even have the right content. So by mm -hmm. doing videos and showing exactly what's included in the box and exactly what's in there, these unboxing videos convert very well. Yeah. And especially if you if – you, will post an unbiased review. I mean, sometimes the guy will say, hey, you know, this is a great product, but the battery life's not good. Right. So you don't want to be shy about that. I yeah. mean, the Amazon model, if there's a bad review, there's a bad review. If there's a good review, that's okay too. So it's not, you know, biased in any way. People will appreciate that. Right. You know, the vendor videos with all the fancy, uh, you know, graphics and stuff, that's that, that's good for like, you know, um, you know, uh, a sales drive or like a call to action. Right. But, um, the true honest reviews seem to do very well. Yeah. So someone yeah. in their basement just unboxing yeah. it and explaining it and telling yeah, you what they like to do. The reality is people search YouTube um, second after Google. YouTube is the biggest search engine. Right. So you create YouTube into a product video generator yeah. for search. That's where people are going anyways. So why not, right. just put, uh, why, why not just put that on your website? Yeah. And it's, not, it's easier said than done. But the way we're doing it with these advanced algorithms and testing – and cross-selling items and different videos per channel per category is quite advanced, mm -hmm. and um, it's almost mimicking a retail experience on the internet. Right, right. So now that you're going back to your roots, a time, what else is working 
for the website for sales and conversion? Um, good question. So, what else is working? The, the the video conversion helps. I mean, I started the e-commerce thing like Magento was like a new thing then. Like we built our own site mm-hmm. and we kind of do a lot of that in-house now. Mm-hmm. I don't like when I outsource things because I mean I like to outsource things if I can, but a lot of what we do is like very let's custom. say home, homebrewed custom. So it has to be scalable still, but we have our own little tricks and things like that. Mm-hmm. So. One of the things we mentioned was uh, the video that we're doing. Um, even the design of the site and appealing to a, a certain crowd or mm-hmm. a certain like, demographic versus just being open-ended. One of the difficulties is that we sell a lot of different products. So some are tech-based, but some are just gadgets or cool. So how do you present that on one website mm-hmm. and not fragment the it's message? a different audience, you're saying. Like, what are you about? Like, yeah. What is our website about? Are we tech sellers are we gadget sellers are we like right. um, experts in this or that so it's hard to have one website um, create the messages so yeah. a lot of these technologies that render up like responsive um, pages to the consumer seem to win so Amazon will tell you oh if you like this you're going to like that if you're right. in this zip code you're going to want this deal you recently viewed this that those kind of automated algorithmic things seem to be very much, much more um, uh, efficient in converting than just A-B testing and, and manual um, types of things that were more prevalent when I started. Yeah. Now there's technologies that kind of know everything about the user when they log on your page. They track all these different things that most people don't even realize. A little spooky. But um, and I'm not saying I do anything... Uh, you know, in the wrong way, but there's, there's there's so much data you can get about a person when they sign on with Google or Facebook and this and that and cater to them that it's almost an easier sell than when they're in the store. Because you know more about them. Yeah, personalized experience. So how do you do that? How do you, when someone hits your page, you know, it's quantum-wireless.com. That's our, that's our current domain. We're launching, uh, we're going to launch our new domain hopefully in the next uh, three, four weeks. Okay. So, uh, we could do a, maybe an update to the, what is uh, what is it going to be the video we haven't announced it yet. oh you haven't okay maybe we could do like a follow up uh, announcement okay. but uh, yeah well I want to make sure for I the mean, actual... we're, beta, we're, we're beta testing but yeah um, when will it come out um I want to hold you to it I would say in three four weeks okay yeah I just want to know because I'll put it on the actual lower third for you and have the correct one so maybe we won't release it till after you know four weeks after you release it. Um, but yeah, so how do you, well, I guess you're releasing the new site, but so talk about the checkout early on, you mentioned the checkout process. How do you, what do you do to optimize the checkout process? Um, it has to be very easy. It's, um, it, it can become a little, it can be a little crowded as well. So if you go to a popular site, I mean, Amazon's kind of the king of it, but if you go to like a new egg, for example, right. You know, they'll give you like 40 options, which is good and bad. So it used to just be like, you know, you could check out with a credit card, you could pay with PayPal, and there's Google Checkout. Now there's like Visa Pay, Amex Pay, Discover Pay, and Chase, and um, MasterCard Pay, where they actually verify, which is good for fraud protection, and that's a whole other discussion. Um, but the key to checkout is guaranteeing someone that they're safe, that there's a real site, that yeah. they're going to deliver. Security. You have the return policy there. You have all mm-hmm. of your trust symbols. Yeah. Um, you try to do the appropriate upsells or cross-sells in the cart and leave no questions unanswered so they don't have to browse out of it because you really want something to buy. Most people abandon the cart, you know, yeah. 97%. Right. So there's following up with the people who abandon via email. There's optimizing the checkout page where there's very little data entry, whether you use your Facebook profile or your Google or your PayPal and just buy it. You know, obviously, if you want to make a profile and sign up, that's great. But people don't like doing that. So always to offer guest checkout. I don't like when people don't do that because it's kind of annoying and people make avoid it, it easier. Don't put up another barrier for someone. Right. Make it easy. I mean, you still want the customer. You want them to sign up for the newsletter and, and, and to constantly, you know, be able to reach out to them in a ethical way uh, via, you know, drip marketing and send them the new deals. You know, hey, you bought this. Maybe you'd like that. Yeah. Um, but the checkout has to be very, very simple. And now that things are mobile, um, it's more difficult. The screens are smaller. 
the it's a little more clumsy. Yeah. People are a little worried about the security. I was at a a mobile uh, summit. It was a uh, it was a research kind of summit slash trade show yeah. um, in California. Yeah, were you um, you were speaking at a Think Global too, right? You spoke at Think Global. Or yeah, that, yeah. Was, that, that that's something else. That's, that's oh, okay. um, international commerce. But okay. I didn't speak at this other event. It was just a mobile commerce yeah. thing. So it was like seventy <laughs> delegates. I was one of them of like you know. Internet retailer 500 or Fortune 500 retailers, yeah. and the whole thing was mobile, yeah. like like StubHub and PayPal and um, Adidas, very big companies. Yeah. You know, all, all companies that you would, would hear of uh, were not as large. I was honored to be there. Yeah, um, I had an interesting, I guess, insight on my own right. But um, that's what these companies are struggling with: keeping the mobile customer, tracking them across devices, which is what I spoke about before. Yeah. Um, so how do you get them to check out on a mobile device? Yeah. Um, so what people say? Apple, so, 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 no, so, so this is, it's all very new and it's very exciting, but you know, things like Apple pay where if it's integrated into your mobile app, you could just press your button, you mm. just put, swipe your finger, Android pay or Samsung pay. That's kind of the way where it's going to be, or, or Google checkout. Those are the ways that should convert the best, although it doesn't always. Um, and there's a lot of different integrations and. You know, Apple Pay works with this vendor on this site in this browser. Right. Not so straightforward. Right. You have to have the app, and someone doesn't want to download the app. Um, but being able to log into your profile with your saved information on a popular site that you trust and just check out. Um, there was even a company there that was advertising um, where you just enter your email and they ship your order. And then later on, they send you an invoice to really? email. Yeah. Hmm. And you pay. And if you don't, they charge you interest. So they make more money on the interest. It's like a pay me later thing. But the point is, wow. they have the reason why they're able to do that is because like, they're almost a bank in themselves. And they have the they tool. They could finance it. To prov- they could finance it and they could prevent fraud. So they could, they could like, in a millisecond calculate the chance that this is fraud or not based on your IP and your email address. Right. It, with this data that they have. And, right. you know, it's usually not fraud. And even if it is. That's really interesting. The fees are hedged by, you know, um, all the profit they make from, let's say, the interest. If you want to take a loan on it, you can. Yeah. But the reason is, a lot of times, you'll do research on your phone. I do this sometimes. Like on the bus, I want to buy a wallet, for example. I needed a new wallet. So I was looking on the, on the, on the on my phone this morning yeah. for a wallet on Amazon and on some sites or Nordstrom, whatever. But to actually go buy it on the phone, I don't... It seems like my wife likes to do that. I don't really like to do that so much. Um... Then I'll go to the computer and really buy it. Right. So that's their idea. Like find it on the phone, add it to the cart, and then go into your online profile there and have it be in your cart. So this company's like, no, don't even do that. Just send it to your mm. email and complete the transaction. Really interesting. So it triggers you. Yeah. And that's, uh, I think on the mobile level, we're getting a little deep here, that's the right way to Yeah. even less, less friction than a computer because yeah. There's very little real estate. People are all over their phone getting texts and this and WhatsApp. And like, you really, if you really want to sell them, it has to be as simple as possible. Right. And we're working on that as well on our new rollout. Yeah. No, thanks for sharing that. So what were your, you said you had some unique insights at that conference. What were your as insights? As far as the mobile. As far as what I learned or? No, you, I don't know. You said you bring, you brought some unique or maybe you gained some unique insights from. No, just, just, just how big mobile is. Mm-hmm. Numbers. I mean, eBay as a company is definitely not doing as great as they were. But 63, I think, percent of their sales are mobile. Wow. Some of the companies displaying they were showing how big mobile is. Yeah. But yet how undeveloped it is. Uh, the top 20 or 30 internet retailers only within the last year or two developed mobile-friendly, responsive sites. So you just have these clumsy sites where you would have to like zoom in and buy it. Right. It was almost impossible. And now it's like dominating mm. and it's quick and it's impulsive and it's 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 great the problem is it's it's very fragmented like all these new technologies mm-hmm. so who you know who will win the war of mobile payments blah 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 and how does that affect your conversion right i, I was very um intrigued i guess it was the insights i learned about how important that is yeah now you have to have to be built up a site and a, and a base and have a good product to sell to even right. you know play in the mobile space but once you you do have that you know, how do you capitalize on those customers? Yeah. So what do you go home and do with the business after hearing all that? 
the question. Um, so it's it's actually a good time for me because since we're redoing our site, yeah. I had the luxury of building in that as well. So let's say my Magento developer would build the responsive design as well. Instead of doing it twice, a lot of times people build a site. Right. When they build the mobile version of the site, or they host the mobile version, or they send the traffic to a server which does the checkout. There's like there's really like 15 different ways they were saying. Right. And some ways are clearly not the way to do it. But it's right. a question, the top four or five ways, what to do it. Yeah. So, you know, we have a responsive site, and maybe we'll have a mobile app. But the, you don't also want to cannibalize your sales. Sometimes you have a mobile app and a site, and you can't always know what's going on. Right. Um, one of the interesting topics was how do you track a user across platforms? So these big companies like StubHub want to know every user. Right. So let's say you go into StubHub, right, to buy Cubs tickets. Right. on your computer but you don't check out right and then you go on to your ipad or whatever how do they know you're the same user right so obviously if you log in they could track you and give right. you suggestions but if you if you don't log in and yeah. everyone's like using six devices a day and your wife yes. and your kid they have no idea who you are so there's a lot of technology now with beacons mm -hmm. and location and ip matching yeah. to say hey this is the same user based on his actions right and if you could master that which is quite mathematical you could really convert a lot better yeah. Um, it's almost a little scary that whole like Facebook discussion of how much data these retailers and these cookies right. and these these companies have about you. Yeah. So, what were some of the, were there some leading companies that do that that cross platform tracking? So, actually, the gentleman from StubHub was talking about it, and he was saying like we track all of our users if they log in, but if they don't log in, how do I know that this is this person? Right. Even if it's the same IP address, it could be someone on the same router. Right. So there are ways. It's funny. I met one company at a different show, uh, at Etel, that keep, they use some kind of advanced algorithms to track behavior and track location. Right. Um, I forgot the name of the company, but that's kind of like the next. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I feel like I talked to someone who that's exactly what their company does, and now I can't remember what the company yeah, it's, is called. It's, it's quite obscure, but there's ways to do it. It's definitely not a perfect science. Yeah. But um, a couple ways I, uh, I I spoke to the gentleman about it and and, and they're working on it. But um, there's so many different platforms and devices that like, yeah. as you said, how do you convert? But how do you know where the person's coming from? There's so many sources. Right. Um, it becomes like an enormous task. Right. Because so, that person could have been you could have been looking at your you know about the for the wallet on your mobile, but then you go to the you know your desktop and they don't know it's the same person yeah you know? i think his example was you, you you go on your mobile in the morning you check it at work on your desktop then you go home while you're watching a show on your ipad look at it again then you buy it then you buy it on your computer at home right but you don't get it delivered you do in-store pickup which is another interface. Like he, he, he gave like the basically most any example, possible scenario you could. But yeah. it was like touching ten different devices and fifteen right. servers, and and it's amazing how these big companies are able to, you know, aggregate that data and actually take action on it. Yeah, um, it's quite amazing. Yeah, and I don't think people realize. I know people don't realize a lot of that, but. Yeah. Um, what would you have done, Aton, if you came? You weren't redeveloping the whole site. And you knew mobile is this important. Like if 63% of people on eBay are purchasing off mobile, what do you go back and do if you're not redoing the whole site? Um, so th there's just like two thoughts on it. Like responsive is more like when you – there's responsive and adaptive. So responsive has kind of become the more common uh, – mm -hmm. Way to go. Adaptive is like if you if I pull up your site on my phone, it'll just shrink a little. It like squeezes it. So yeah, know, it'll yeah. squeeze a little based yeah. on the rendering of my thing. So, yeah. but, uh, of my the pixels in my frame. But there's actually uh, that's kind of the old school way of doing it. But right. some big retailers still have that. Responsive is almost like dynamic, so it knows it's a iPhone. It'll render an iPhone friendly. Yeah. There's even device specific. So there's some companies where you have the checkout run through them. So they go to my site. They can read the user ID. They know he's on a Samsung Galaxy mm -hmm. S3 in Madagascar. Right. So there's no point in rendering him high def video because the site won't load. Right. So Given the most minimalist mm. approach, just to do checkout. Right. But if you're in like South Korea on you know two gigabit, you know Ethernet, right. you know they'll they'll flood you with 4K video. Yeah. So that's really very like, sophisticated. Sophisticated. Yeah. Cool. Um. 
yeah so those are the things that you know you can implement yeah knowing the trend although yeah i just think it's a it's a it's a it's really interesting the trend's growing i mean yeah. obviously most people are a lot of people are buying on a computer but yeah since people are using their phone so much they're, they're using it for everything right so it's yeah yeah some of the numbers like blew my mind so software wise what kind right. of things do you use to run the business um and you mentioned magenta what kind of like shopping cart do you use a certain abandonment is this in-house custom what what things yeah. do you use for retargeting what what, what kind of so um the website's mostly like the traditional type of tools you know like remarketing tools email marketing mm -hmm. um card abandonment software mm -hmm. analytics yeah. a b testing conversion a lot mm -hmm. of these things are becoming like very commoditized so like there's like one software that'll do it all or google right. offers free software that does it right. um, a lot of the shopping feed software where you could load your, your products into google get the feature there and that's like a whole big trend now yeah so um, what do you use for those things um a lot of it is like just third party uh um software so like a mailchimp or a mm -hmm. something like that for email mm -hmm. or um We've asked for some paid search. Sometimes we use some software that can that combines different paid search engines um, to manage in one. Mm -hmm. um, the SEO and a lot of the content we do here. Mm -hmm. um, the video and some of the other technology, we have some strategic partners. But a lot of what we do is unique. Uh, we try to be a little different in that regard. So mm -hmm. I don't want to use the typical off-the-shelf you know, yeah. email program that everyone else is using. Right. Um, I want to do it differently and try to get a better result. Some people don't like that because it's a lot more cost and risk, right. but it's worked so far for yeah. us. What about shopping um, cart? What do you what do you use? We use, magento, we use a Magento cart. Yeah. Um, and there's goods and yeah. What do you like and not like? Things. Yeah. Um, it's very feature rich. It's a very heavy program. So a lot of times when you're doing coding or if things go wrong, the whole site can crash. There's mm -hmm. a lot of files to be involved in. Some of these new Shopify big commerce are easier to roll out, but they're mm -hmm. not as feature rich. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's there's pluses and minuses. Right. A lot of the software that we use also is for a lot of the channels and other sales um, places. So if we're selling on Amazon or we're selling on, on Newegg or whatnot, you know, different repricing strategies. Mm -hmm. You could automate how you price products based on demand, based on sell price. Mm -hmm. uh, we have ways of indexing different sites and seeing what's popular mm -hmm. to identify product there's so much data out there that people a scrape is uh i'm not the best word to say parse <laughs> or identify where you could just it sounds less research. it sounds less black hat right yeah, I mean, yeah. you could do research on products and know what to sell just based on the lack of the offering or the lack of competition yeah so we have a whole buying team that identifies products with different web tools that we build mm -hmm. based on product reviews on popular sites based on can we support the margin or the price? Mm -hmm. uh, where will we offer it? Um, that's on the you know product scouting side, and then as far as internally logistics, we have a whole system like what from when we bring a product in to when it ships, aging, reporting, all this kind of mm -hmm. stuff. We're trying to do it quite um, unique, automated, yeah, automated and yeah, unique where there's you know different. Um, buyers in the company yeah. that are responsible for different lines and things like that and everything is transparent and open yeah. so repricing wise do you use something internal or do you use something external or if you use something internal what what tools yeah, right, should people be right looking now at? we're we're um kind of a transitioning mm -hmm. we've used app eagle which is like a general amazon repricer we've mm -hmm. tried there's a company called feedvisor that we've used um they do it in different ways there's a lot of them it's yeah. almost become very popular yeah and each has its own uh, value, but we, we have a very unique um, way of sell, uh, pricing products and selling products. So mm -hmm. my partner, Jonathan Goldman, um, he's quite adept at like knowing how to price a product and what to buy and right. when and how to sell it. So we're kind of re writing our own repricing rules. I see. Building an engine around that. And that's yeah. a lot of the proprietary data, how to price, right. where to list. You know, maybe it's cheaper on Best Buy, so we should list our price on our side at X. So there's definitely tools that do it, but there's like so many variables right. to teach. It's that a million through. different variables. So yeah. Ahead, that we try to automate as much as we can, but a yeah. lot of it's really up to yeah. you know, the head buyers or right. the, the the salespeople. Yeah, I mean, because it could be 
time of year will affect it or besides there's anything else. There's seasonality, there's, yeah. there's, you know, the Black Friday effect, and they had this Amazon Prime Day effect, which is like this new fad. There's uh, products that go end of life. There's things that get recalled. You can't perfectly define it. Right. But whatever we can, we try to right. implement without making it too complex for yeah. someone to understand. Yeah. I'm wondering because I know some people don't use repricing tools. So I'm wondering what's the advantage and disadvantage? What are people's reasons for using or not using these repricing yeah, tools? We used to not use repricing as much because we didn't really trust it. Right, right. Sometimes you were losing money and you weren't really able to capitalize. They're right. much more advanced now. Mm -hmm. That being said, with all these variables and changes to APIs and channels, they don't always work like they should. Right. But if you have you know, thousands of SKUs to manually do it, you know, you may be making a couple more dollars, but but long term, it doesn't make any sense efficiency wise. So it's right. all about speed and efficiency for us. Mm -hmm. And there's some things you have to do manual, um, but if you can program those rules to the best of your ability, yeah. maybe it won't be perfect, but it'll be pretty good. Um, you could focus your time on other things. Yeah. And not have to be so worried about every single penny of a reprice right. what another vendor selling at but adding value with customer service or the other tools I spoke about improving checkout and things like that which actually proved to be more lucrative than you know making another 2% on one random SKU yeah so Eitan what is your proudest automation that it was so manual that you were just so proud you actually whatever set up rules and and things that you can automate this process that was taking your company forever manually. It's a toughie. We're doing a lot of it now. Yeah, I mean, maybe name a few. I'm just curious because I know you seem we to be. We uh, yeah. a lot of our warehousing. Uh -huh. So oh, we used to run a warehouse with a lot of overhead and employees and mm -hmm. HR. And we have a lot of custom ways that we ship, whether we're shipping to Amazon. Amazon fulfillment, shipping to Europe, shipping mm -hmm. to retailers, shipping to, you know, uh, Walmarts or Amazons of the world or yeah. small business or government. And it was like very unique and I didn't really yeah. think the warehouse would be able to handle it. Right. But I spoke to uh, a buddy of mine and he's like, why are you doing warehousing? Like, that's not your business. Right. Let someone who knows how to do it, do it. So right. for all the e-commerce stuff, like the tools... That is our business, but for like logistics, like why do I have to be a logistics person? So not only did I save probably half of a bill a month, probably fifty percent of my warehouse fees. Wow. Um, I didn't have to deal with all the drama of the warehouse and the potential accidents, the workers' comp and issues, right. um, late shipments, etc. I could hold the the third party warehouse accountable. Yeah. It, I was able to train them within our own, let's say, special sauce of how we do things. Yeah. And that freed up all the time of managing them and we could focus on sales yeah so that's kind of what we try to do on all fronts so right, right. Um, so that people don't have to spend so much time if it, a really good buyer or a procurement person wants to just find products all day not worry about how to deal with returns how to restock the right amount so we right. have a lot of data people even data analysts on board that just focus on that with different software almost like engineers right um you're talking about identifying products to buy? Identifying, and then when you have them, how much should you reorder? When should you reorder? Right. What price should you pay? What type of shipping should you use? All these things take so much time, and we automate a lot of that flow so that once the product's brought on, it could continue and do as well as it can based on all the rules that are built into the system. Yeah. And that's uh, very powerful. Yeah, because you don't want to have tons of product and inventory and just sitting there. That, that's the first thing. And the second thing is you don't want someone who's a salesperson dealing with logistics and returns and forecasting. Let them just do sales, right? That's right. what you're good at. Right. Let's do that and then have someone else. So that's the thing we learned, maybe maybe the hard way, you know, find the skill of a person in, within the organization and have them focus on what they're good at and the things that they may not be good at or they're okay at, but it just shouldn't be their core. Give it to someone who can do it much better or mm -hmm. have the software help them with it yeah so, so a lot of our, our purchasing department was spending so much time worrying about how to buy more and when to buy more that's that really shouldn't be their concern yeah it just took us a while to figure out the puzzle so how did you take it off their plate slowly building <laughs> and trying and failing and 
ordering too much or too little and realizing why and understanding the return rate. There's so many variables. So many moving parts here. Yeah, cost, shipping, international, VAT. It's very, very uh, multi-layered, but and it's always improving. But yeah, there's definitely uh, a lot of moving parts. Yeah. And a lot of the office shelf software does something, but not everything. That's why people tend to want to do custom things. The problem right. is when you do custom software, it's like, you know, you're addicted to it. You just take a patch and a patch and a patch. Same thing with Magento. Like, there's a big community. So if you mm -hmm. have a problem, you can ask the community. If you go with a custom mm -hmm. solution, you know, when your programmer is not around. Something goes down, you're up the It's creek. a big problem. Yeah. And I'd rather have a community. So what we do is kind of a hybrid. We have a lot of community open source software, but we also have some customizations to it that are documented. Mm -hmm. So we know what's going on. And we understand how to build it and how to enhance upon it. Yeah. Hey, Ethan, that's another thing that um, I've heard a lot of people talk about is identifying products. They want to keep expanding the product line. What are some things you look for in what to sell next? Good question. You know, um, there's different sites to look at. I mean, Amazon's great because just as a data source, mm -hmm. you know, whether you're selling there or not, you can see what's popular. Yeah. So you could see X products popular. Yeah. Is Amazon carrying it? If not, you could carry it on your website and list it on Google mm -hmm. or list it on eBay or list it on Amazon. Or what, what we're trying to do and what a lot of companies do is like, you know, I'll just make my own product like that. Mm -hmm. That's a whole different conversation. Yeah. It's, I know you had that, uh, you had a discussion with, um, was it Tech Armor? Mm hmm. Yeah. I mean, he's making his own um, brand, your brand versus selling other brands. Yeah, brand name case, and they do a great job. They do an amazing job. And we're kind of getting into that uh, level of um, advancement. So yeah. we sell other people's stuff. Like, that's great. You could sell a lot of other people's stuff, and you can right. make money. That's what most retailers do. Right. But the next level is, what about it? What if you private labeled something? Right. Right. So I sell a router, but I call it the, the Aton router. And then the next level is that. So <laughs> right. the my own Aton router, or it's my own chips, my own padded, my own IP. Right. So I create a lot of value in my company. I'm not just reselling and turning revenue. Right. I have my own patents and my own products and my own ideas and my own licenses. Yeah. So we're slowly like getting into that. Yeah. Proprietary bundles, diversifying products, you know, upsells to it, adding in accessories, all these little tricks that we learned along the way. Right. Um, a lot failed, but we're, you know, trying to implement yeah. And uh, there's just not enough time in the day. Right. What makes you decide to, you know, this is too much of a hassle. Let's just sell the, the brand versus private labeling it or creating your own your own product. It's a good question. A lot of the private label stuff that does well on these sites is like cheap items, you know, like a power bank or like the, the cell protector cases, like to make your own, the things that we like to sell, like routers right. or range extenders or switches, like that's pretty expensive stuff the right. mold, like to make your own mold or to make your own hardware is, yeah. is costly and a lot of times yeah. you find a factory and they don't really do such a good job yeah. and or they sell to someone else and he just labels it and there's a trust factor so it's very hard to decide um let's say which product to go about making yeah. um we're trying to do it on a higher level where um it's not not everyone's doing it, and it's because it's difficult. But that's what gives us like the the one up. Right. We understand it. We we've tested similar products. We have a lot of vendors. We go to shows all over the world. They have a great product, but they want to sell in the U.S. So I could just you know put my name on their product, but what if we had our own little twist to it, right. and it was mine? And then from that, learn and create our own. Yeah. So we're 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 working at that pretty hard. It just. It's a very long process. Yeah. And um, it's really interesting. Yeah. I ask because I'm sure you have tons of data with through the years of what sells well and what doesn't sell well. And you probably have your finger on the pulse of, well, we could, you know, we could do really well with this because we already sold thousands of this one thing. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, looking at rankings on Amazon, looking at rankings in Google, uh, even at retail, you can see what sells, what's hot. Everyone knows, you know, Fitbits are hot right. now and uh, Android watches. Although right. I try to stay away from that stuff because it's almost too competitive. Mm. But the things that are, are niche markets that are popular, 
which are really hard to identify. I can't tell you exactly how we do it. Some of it's like proprietary. Some of it's just hard to understand or explain in a conversation like this. Right. But um, adding value to some existing products or modifying products to create a need or to answer a need. Right. So if someone has a product, you make a modification to it. Yeah. And you know you make it just a little better than the other guy. Right. At a different price point. Yeah. Uh, something like that. Um, yeah. You mentioned some other- things that really work too, which is not just, you know, so I don't want to breeze over it, but not just your own brand, but you mentioned bundles and, and things like that. What else works as far as, I guess, seems to increase the dollar value of the of the customer who's already coming for something else? Um. Yeah, a lot of it's the cross sells, the upsells. So within the you know the website, you know, suggesting accessories, suggesting mm-hmm. warranty, which usually helps the customer mm-hmm. at the end of the day, especially if it's an electronic product. Mm-hmm. Um, suggesting something that um, you know maybe they want to upgrade to later on. Um, we we talk about bundles and kits, gift cards, things like that. Just little things here and there that differentiate mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. you know, if everyone's selling the same camera and you throw in which is this classic camera space you know everyone tries oh i'll give you a 32 gig sd card i'll give you a 40 gig sd mm-hmm. card you know that's kind of how you get the customer the they don't really make, the, yeah, yeah they don't really don't make, make so much money on the camera because the margins are tiny but they make money on all the accessories they sell with it because the margin is great because they're, they're manufacturing those products right and they always want to one up the other guy by adding another accessory mm-hmm. or another value yeah. add yeah, what's another example of that as a value add that, like, not with cameras, but another product that that people so, do? So one, so one specific one is, um, I mean, like, like how we started, like tech support. Yeah. So a lot of times people call call up. Some of the products on our site are just, you know, three four hundred dollar items. We also sell very high end stuff. So yeah, they'll come to us. We'll explain, and when they buy it, we do installations often. Or we'll outsource it to consulting, or when we do government projects, mm-hmm. we'll try to add value by that by, by um, free tech support, you know, sixty day, you know, return policy, yeah. whatever you could do to kind of yeah make the com- customer a little more comfortable than the For other sure. guy. Yeah, every little thing, from conversion to site speed to service to warranty, um, yeah. goes a long way, and we actually measure all these things. Yeah. I for sure buy things. I mean, if someone provides a personalized service or support, I would ch- hands down choose that over anything else. Yeah. Right. And the problem with the, the channels and the Amazons is that, as I said before, regarding um, data and content, people just like buy it because all the product description is there, but a lot of times it's wrong or it's incomplete. So if you can't speak to a person, if you call up Amazon and ask them about one of their 2 billion products, they're probably not going to know the answer. Right. Uh, the seller usually will know if you're selling it, yeah. or a website owner really must know. Yeah. And, and sometimes it's a big deal. A lot of times you get government or enterprise customers that don't really care how much something costs. I mean, obviously they have a budget, but right. if they're going to spend 20% more and trust they're getting what they need, right. it's better than buying something cheap and having getting in trouble by their boss or having something fail and the internet be down for their jobs in jeopardy. Yeah. A week. Yeah. So that's a big part of it. Yeah. You know, because in my research, Eitan, I found like this was a key differentiator, a huge differentiator between your company and many other companies out there. And you know, I think you know one of the questions I wrote down when I was doing the research was about tech support and how do you compete when other people have the same router or the same signal booster? And one of the things you put in was tech support. How do you dial in that tech support? What's your process for actually you know, training the tech support and making sure they're actually not just doing what they do, but also sometimes a tech support person I would see is maybe not a sales person. But right, so it's a, yeah, so that's kind of the model we developed early on, working with those repeater companies. We we got trained, so like I actually flew to Utah. Mm-hmm. I used to do it myself, um, and got certified in this product. And I flew to whatever, and I got certified in this WiMAX product, mm-hmm. or this Booster product, or this Cisco product. And I would train a lot of the tech guys when we started, mm-hmm. and now they go to trainings and we get certifications. So not only do we know a lot about it, but when you do that, the vendor likes it and they'll send you leads. Mm. So 
a lot of vendors will link to my website or, or, or give people my phone number. Oh, I want to do an installation. Oh, call Aton from Quantum. You know, they can really help you out with your, your signal booster needs or your your uh, wireless failover solution. Um, I see. So we're experts. You know, we're certified. We do the training. Uh, we have the demo products we can show people. And they'll link to our website because they know we're certified. They don't want to link to a website of someone who's just, you know, selling the product for like, you know, 2% margin. Right. They want to link to someone who knows about the product who yeah. can support and help it. And then they don't have to worry about the sales because they're just manufacturers. Right. And all these manufacturers that we represent don't really know that much about not, not I mean, they know. It depends on the size. But the medium to, to small ones that we find on these, like, up-and-coming sites, they don't really know that much about sales. They made a really cool product. They raised money on Kickstarter. Now what? How do you sell? How do you fulfill a product? How do you get right. it into retail? Right. How do you market it? And how do you do tech support? So we're able to offer a lot of these things to them, and they're like, you know, it's like a turnkey solution to get your yeah. product sold. Yeah. Anywhere from the internet uh, in the U.S. to the rest of the world, to the government, um, to retail, like a one-stop shop. And right. that's kind of newer, you know, adding on all these different verticals yeah. really satisfies a lot of their needs, and they're just happy making product. And we have a lot of exclusive agreements with these, so we're kind of like a quasi-distributor, like real value distributor. Usually you say value-added reseller. So we get an exclusive, you know, we don't want the product, you know, people selling it below a certain price, etc. We're not a distributor in the classical sense where we rep, you know, like thousands yeah. of brands, but we have a specific type of a brand that we look for that does very well, and that's part of that like secret sauce I was trying to right, right. explain. There's a lot yeah. of factors. No, you know what? I'm glad you said that because that was not the answer I was expecting to get. You know, and you know, rela- relationship is huge, and becoming an expert is huge because then they trust you, and they know that you're an expert, and so they want to refer people to you who are going to take care of them because in the end, it's their product. I was thinking you were going to say something like, well, we have, you know, the, the uh, we're experts in the product, and so the tech support people know, well, you know, at this point in the time, maybe after two years, the router, you know, tends to diminish or something, so you need a warranty for two, you know, since you're an expert in the product, there's certain things that that person needs to support the the product, you know, that would be like an upsell or something like that. Um, that's what I thought that, you were going to say. Yeah. Well, as far as, I mean, that that's the case as well. Meaning a lot of times people call up, you know, four years later, hey, this doesn't work. And I'll be like, yeah, because, you know, that software doesn't work anymore. Right. You need to buy this new thing. Or we could support it, but we recommend this product. So that's right. a way to, to keep the customer. Um but we'll still help them with a legacy or old product as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, sure. So and then after the- we get the trainings, you know, we have a, a people in house or sometimes overseas that that really, and, and we make sure that we know whatever detail we need to know. Yeah. What um you know we talked about boosting sales um, on the website. What about off? You know, on the different platforms, is there any things people should be doing on? Amazon insights into Amazon and eBay. Yeah, it's a loaded topic. Um, yeah, there's a lot of things. Um, again, back to my my point of product quality. So a lot of the listings were made by other sellers, or sometimes by Amazon. They're not really done well. Mm-hmm. You know, improving photos, improving content, improving mm-hmm. description and keywords is so big. People don't realize it. Having like five or six really good high res photos of a product. Now they even support video. Um, having the bullet points very clear. Um, obviously, getting try to get product reviews for your own product, or um, you know, for the for the vendor's product, is very important. Right. Um, and now there's this whole world of advertising within the channel. So Amazon has sponsored listings where you can promote your product amongst another. Mm-hmm. Or when someone searches this router, you can show your router. It's almost like Google AdWords on Amazon. Mm-hmm. They used to send traffic to other websites. Now they're doing it internal. Right. And the new eggs and the and the, and the best and the Rakutans and all those other guys have that as well. Um, so those are some things you really have to be on top of to stand out. Right. Um, the the classic stuff of you know good feedback, good customer support. Yeah. You know a lot of these channels like, as you know, eBay is very very strict about shipping times and feedback, and Amazon's even more. Uh, people get 
thrown off the channel for silly things that are often not their fault. Mm -hmm. You have to really have an insurance policy. You can't rely, which I was going to say in the beginning, uh, on one channel, yeah. which is why you have to have a website. You have to be doing multiple things, not to be fragmented, but to diversify and ensure your longevity right. and be able to pivot as needed. Mm -hmm. That's what we're working hard to do. Yeah. So what about, you know, we talked about boosting sales. What about common mistakes you see other people making or mistakes that you wish you would have avoided throughout? Yeah, you know, when we started to get into some of the channel sales, we were doing a lot of um, almost like deal opportunities. We were buying a lot of one product, you know, like a pallet of this or 5,000 of these. Mm. That whole Groupon daily deal model, which as many out there know, it didn't really do so well for these companies. Yeah, uh, I think Google was going to buy Groupon for $6 billion, and they didn't. And actually, Groupon is doing decent now. Though. And the only, one of the only, uh, sorry, one of the main drivers of profit for eBay and Groupon are their daily deals of product, not of the, you know, get a free helicopter ride or whatever. Not the services, but the product. Right. But all these little sites, and I know I have a lot of friends who have sites like this, and they did it like they ran a deal every day. So every day they're buying a pallet from China or they're getting returns selling it. It only lasts so long. So this whole right. fad of going after a product doesn't really last. And it's not you can, it's very hard to find any sustainable model for it. So we had a lot of purchasing people that were going after deals. So I call them the one-hit wonders. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can have a lot of one-hit wonders, but where's the longevity? Not sustainable. When you buy 10,000 routers and it just doesn't sell. You can go out of business at you know a uh, three four hundred dollar router that's you know millions of dollars. Right. So you have to really be on, and you have to have a plan. If you can't sell it, how are you going to get rid of it? How are you going to return it? What's the reverse logistic process? People don't understand returns. Most sellers on channels yeah. have pallets and pallets of returns. They don't understand reverse logistics. Spend a lot of time on honing in on that, getting value, trying to resell, refurbish, yeah. send back to vendor. And having any excess inventory and always being as lean as possible. So once we realize, you know, we could do these deals, but, you know, you have a couple bad ones, I'll, I'll still take up a deal and look into it if it makes sense. And I have a much better understanding of how much I can move. But to, for that to be your only model, a deal, it's almost like you're gambling every day. Yeah. And a lot of companies lost a lot of money. They were sitting on, uh, I know some, like, personally, like, you know, $20, 30000000 million of dead inventory. Wow. Because they just kept on buying more and more. Because the sales were higher and higher. Yeah, why was it so appealing they to them? They weren't attuned to the numbers. Like, there were these certain deal sites that people would go to every day and buy product. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of just got old, just like most fads. And what these sites do now, which is actually interesting, is they don't hold product. They're just, a, they're just an affiliate. So if you were, you know, Jeremy's Deals and you had a new deal every day, you realize it doesn't make sense to hold all the debt and the warehousing. But you have 10 million subscribers. Right. So you team up with Amazon and other sites. And you just post deals every time something sells. You get an affiliate. They drop ship type of thing. So you're no, they, you give them the sale, but you get oh. a six percent affiliate. Huh. Or if it's apparel, a higher percent affiliate. So just because of your user base of six million customers, you could partner with you them. You can make a ton mm -hmm. of money, and you make more money doing that, and less headache than running a huge business that does hundreds of millions in revenue and, yeah. and almost no profit. So. That's something we weren't really so heavy into deals, but it was a lot of our business. Now we build long lasting relationship with vendors, whether we have an exclusive, whether it's a high end vendor like a hard drive company that we just constantly sell. Whenever they come out with new products, we stock the new products. Whenever they have end of life deals or closeouts or refurbished opportunities, we can buy those as well. But we don't have to look for this like one deal, you know, or one guy calling me up, Hey, I have a, a great opportunity for you. Usually those are too good to be true. Right. And you can make money on them for sure, and I, people are great at it. It's just becoming harder and harder, and there's no longevity. So my my advice is people online like looking for these like quick hits. Mm. It's like any business. I'm sure you've interviewed a lot of people. There's no quick hits. Right. There's no easy wins. There's a lot of failure involved. Right. Because someone's on whatever list or they look really special doesn't mean they don't struggle or and suffer and right. go through a lot of stress. Yeah. Um, and that's because. It's a it's it's trial and error, trial and error. Right. Even when you get better, you still need to um, 
hone in on what you're doing mm-hmm. and try to perfect it. We still have so much we can do. We should yeah. be doing that we haven't even got to. But um, I think it's a much more sustainable model, you know, to to build relationships with vendors instead of just flipping deals and finding this one thing here and there. Mm-hmm. There's this whole retail arbitrage uh, sector, right, right. so to speak. Uh, I know people make a lot of money doing it. They'll basically go to a store, a Best Buy, or a Target. Right. There's a lot of articles about it. People will go to these Target flash shells and sell it online. Yeah. And then Target started restricting who could do that because the vendor got upset. Oh, wow. And the only reason Target did the flash shell with a big company, like, uh, what was the one? Uh, Lily Pul- Pulitzer. I know there's a couple companies. Um, was because they wanted to bring people into the store. So they break even on the flash shell, but they get someone in the store. And as you know... And as my wife knows, once you go to Target, you always come out with $300 of stuff. Right. You don't know why, but you just have $300 of stuff. <laughs> That's just how it is because they're great. So their whole draw of the see. flash shell was a co-brand and get into the store. Right. So there were so many of these people buying the stuff to sell it online. It's like when you buy the iPhone, you wait online, you go to Australia, you get, go all over the world just to have the first time the iPhone. Yeah. Apple sells out, you sell it online for like 700% profit. Mm-hmm. It's a great deal, right? But what happens when you buy a bad batch or you lose one pallet and you're working on such thin margins? Right. These are not sustainable uh, businesses, in my opinion. Yeah. They're these like quick hits. Yeah. So if you're really good, you could you could, you could could last. But there's it's always just a cash. lot of hustle and it's a lot of work. A lot of hustle. There's yeah. always cash flow and there's always cash flow issues and, 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 and trust issues. So... You know, building your own brand is much harder to do, and and having long trusted relationships takes a lot of time and effort and travel. Yeah. But to do it the right way and long right. is, I think, is much um, much more sustainable. Much more sustainable, yeah. but it takes a lot of patience and time. Yeah. So, Eitan, speaking on that, um, daily deals is a big mistake you see people making. What else? What else do people make do that you're just shaking your head that? It's a lot of advice. unethical practice. I mean, channels, you know, people sell uh, items refurbished, they clean it up, they sell it as new. Like, you try mm. to cut corners. Um, sometimes you get a deal, you think it's too good to be true. It is because it was perhaps stolen or this or whatever it is, and you wind up losing your Amazon account or you wind up losing your, mm. you know, your Better Business Bureau calls you up. Uh, better to investigate or pay a premium for inspection and use the right warehouse in China and mm-hmm. not... You know, Pennywise Pound Foolish right. is the theme of what I'm trying to say. Right. So obviously, I'd like to get things at lower cost, yeah. but not things that break yeah. and not things that aren't trusted. Right. A lot of people try to cut corners. It's kind of easier to do online because you're just like a solo guy in your basement. You could do whatever you want. You know, you're not a storefront. You know, you're not Macy's. Um they think they don't have exposure because they're not a and, big Yeah, and people have get into legal issues too because they start selling product that they're not authorized for. Yeah. The vendors want you to sell out a map price, a set price, and you violate it. Mm. And uh, people get sued for things like that. And it just, it's just, there's too much risk to, to put all your eggs into that kind of right. way of doing things. Yeah. We do a lot of online sales, but we, we're very into you know, trust and integrity and, 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 and yeah. doing it the right way, yeah. even if it takes longer. And even if maybe we'll make less money uh, in the immediate, long term we'll we'll be profitable and successful and uh, be able to sleep at night. Yeah. Um, what yeah, do you think? I say, see, that's just uh, an epidemic. Yeah, I wouldn't have thought of that either um, because I guess like, maybe I just think people are honest at heart. But um, what about common practices in e-commerce? Things that are common practices. You've been doing this a long time. What do you go against the grain on when people, you know, maybe there's a common practice of someone, everyone doing it one way and you feel that's not, it should be done a different way. Is there anything like that? As uh, far as like um, strategy? Yeah, it could be strategy. It could be or... how they sell, where they sell, you know, I'm not sure. I just am so, curious I'm of your insights. It surprise you, but I think a lot of it is, is, not so much on the sales, but on, on the people. Mm-hmm. So we really work hard to find talented individuals, unique mm-hmm. individuals with a certain um, savviness to them, whether they come totally raw, you know, out of uh, college with no experience. We kind of mold them yeah. or someone who has a lot of experience and we kind of take from that experience mm-hmm. from 
for bigger companies and molded yeah. in the chemistry. But my point is that the team that you have, I think, is the most mm, most valuable. Most valuable. So your question was about strategy for. I'm just curious if there's any common practices out there that. Yeah. You... yeah so, so the common practices I see, like people hire salesmen or buyers, and they pay them a set salary. There's no incentivized commission. We try to make it like very um, entrepreneurial, almost a great place to work and entrepreneurial, yeah. where people can, you know, they want to make a product, they want to switch positions, they want to try different things. Yeah. Um, we allow for that. Um, a lot of the companies I see, or people who have left my company, and told me like, hey, you know, when we were with you guys, like, it was such an awesome environment. You know, we mm. do team outings and we have a really cool office environment and we buy everyone lunch and all that stuff that you hear from Google and Zappos. Obviously not to that extent because we're not <laughs> a public company. Right. But just having that camaraderie and a team yeah. is something that a lot of these companies don't have. Mm. And they do things kind of, I don't know. It, it's like necessarily... short-sighted maybe. Yeah, short-sighted. So you really want to value your employees and empower them to yeah. want to come and be happy. And that's a big part of it because yeah. I spent a lot of time uh, that I wouldn't even have foreseen most of my time before we got like much a couple more HR people was just like dealing with different personalities and drama in the workplace as you know tough yeah and you know you just want people to come and do their right. job it's hard focus. enough running the business let alone right. dealing with all the so drama I was spending, yeah. you know four hours a day dealing with the warehouse and this person's you know personal drama and this person mm. etc right. which is fine and I'm happy to but um, it takes the focus off Right, so I think one of the yeah. secrets are we, we developed a certain culture that we we look for a certain type of person. Yeah. It doesn't always work out. And we cultivate that environment. So when people yeah. come in, they feel a certain energy. And it's very invigorating and potentiates the effort. Yeah. And I think that's one of the secrets to our success. Yeah. And Yeah, that culture goes back I to... I think the, the people, the what, what do you call it, a personal... Not a personal talent... Um, you're like, what do you call like the commodity, the human commodity? Like, uh, there's a term for it. Human capital? Maybe? Human capital? I don't, I don't yeah. know. But as uh, one of my uh, friends like to always say, um, you know, Google Google bought a couple of companies just for the talent, right? Not for right. the product. Yeah. They they shut the product down, but the talent was there. So right. you have a good person you could who you could delegate to. You could really scale. Yeah. You can't do everything on your own. I mean, the culture comes down to also, Eitan, um, who you bring in. So, and it seems like you're looking and you see specific things or traits. What do you look for? What are you looking for in, in someone? Or what are some things that you've seen in people that you, that you brought in that maybe other people wouldn't have seen or other companies? It's a good question. It really depends on the position. Mm -hmm. Obviously, a programmer is very different than a buyer is yeah. very different than a... Uh, um, warehouse yeah. uh, worker. Tell me one of but, your uh, favorite hires. What's one of the, been one of your favorite hires? Am I dropping names or just uh, no, no position wise, just position wise. As far as that they were successful or just yeah, that you position? yeah, that maybe someone wouldn't have hired someone right out of school for this particular position, but you saw X Y Z trait in this person, and that's why you okay. brought him in. It's interesting. Um, there was a fellow who uh, actually wanted to go to medical school. Mm. And he was kind of transitioning in his life. Brilliant guy. Um, good friend of mine still. And it was a short stint, so I don't know if it's the best example. Right. But the guy came in, and he knew about Amazon. He knew about online. He knew about e-commerce. Just a brilliant guy. He had, like, a degree in uh, physics and all this stuff. And I think in three months, he brought in over 140 different lines. Wow. So he basically identified lines, reached out, sold them out the opportunity, and achieved sales for those lines. It was unbelievable. Um, not all of them worked out, but most right. you know, and that's an extreme rapid pace. Right. But, you know, initially, you know, he, he wasn't sure what he wanted to necessarily do with his life. Right. And I was like, why would I hire this guy? He's going to go to medical school. He's going to leave. Uh, you know, he wound up moving on because, like, you know, it was kind of just uh, right. an experience for him, although we were still really close and he helps us out. But that was something where I was like, I have a gut feeling that yeah. he's gonna be like unbelievable. Yeah, why? And like and he, he was like a hundred times better than I ever thought. Wow. 
the what personality, yeah. the approach, the understanding of the world, really, really in person. Yeah. And the way he was able to get on with a vendor, really no, uh, wasn't nervous, just went straight to the point. And, and, and this is while he was in school. I let, mind you, he wasn't even working full time. Yeah. I've never seen anything like it. So that's yeah. kind of an anomaly. Yeah. I, I asked that because. Example, but yeah. it was something that like there are people like that. Right. I'm asking because you have a gut feeling about that person. I'm wondering what traits, like in hindsight, what did that person have that we should all or that you should be looking at for the next yeah, person that's going to be That like, person was, was quite exceptional. Um, yeah. a certain, there's, a, there's a Hebrew word called seichel which means uh, intelligence, but it's like a higher level of intelligence. Mm -hmm. So I try to look for that. It's hard to explain. Yeah. Do you have it's... anything baked into like the hiring process? Yeah. Like a ta like, what do you do to try and, I mean, obviously it's hard to measure that exactly, but to weed yeah, that so, out. Yeah, so we got <laughs> better at it, meaning we used to do, it was random. Now like, we like to ask the different interviewees the same questions for the same position. Have like one, two, let's say one, two, and then like a final interview. Mm -hmm. um, gut is important, although I learned, you know, through you know business coach type people and whatever that it's really not always what to go with. A lot of times you want to ask people situational things like, "What would you do in this situation?" You don't want to ask someone, "Hey, like, what do you really want to do?" And they're like, "Oh, I want to work for Quantum." They'll, they'll tell you what you want to hear. Mm -hmm. You know, mixing it up a little, asking people what they like to do for fun. Um, letting them speak a lot, trying to listen um, as much as possible. And um, sometimes we give them like a test assignment to see how they would do. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I get back like really uh, nothing. And sometimes people like wow me right. with what they're able to produce. And yeah. it's very clear that they're appropriate. We just hired someone and, and she did a whole presentation to the company and I was like blown away. Huh. Um, a lot of people don't even follow up. A lot of times they say, you know, you know, please follow up with an email. You know, send me re people don't even send references. A lot of people don't even show up for interviews. Believe it or not. Yeah, most I do actually, believe it. No, no, not most. We've got better at it, but a lot of people don't. Yeah. So you know, you have to be there to. Uh, what is it? Half of it. What is that? What are you showing up? Yeah. Yeah. So you got to show up, and then ninety percent is showing up, or whatever it is. Yeah. Produce, but you know, giving them a strategic assignments. Um, other ways of assessing talent. I, I can't yeah. like write it down necessarily. Yeah. It's just kind of yeah. a thing that we get better at. Yeah. Thanks to our HR department and and yeah, and giving them tasks specific to what they should be doing so you see their actual performance. Yeah, that's a good one. Right. That's like a great one. If you were going to sell something online, what product would you pick and why? Yeah. And how would you go about doing it? Yeah. And if you lost the product, how would you call the vendor? Or some almost kind of like role playing a little in the interview is uh, has proven to be. A little more transparent and uh, indicative of their future success or lack thereof. Yeah, and you know, I want to go back. You you mentioned earlier about cash flow. How do you grow as a company when these products are very cat? I mean, require a lot of capital. Good question. Um, yeah, so we didn't start with any money. Um, we didn't have any funding. No. Um, we started buying some product and, you know, we started buying more product and we reinvest the profits into more product. Um, we started with credit cards. We had high credit card lines. Mm. I actually um, was able to build credit card lines with the payment. I had a good credit history and we built it up. And then as we built relationships with vendors and we always paid on time, they, they extended us credit. And then slowly but surely we built our credit and we were able right. to go to bank for credit, let's say. Yeah. Although although we don't really we still are using similar methods. We have lines of credit from vendors, right. we have credit card lines, we have bank lines of credit if needed. But a lot of it's organic. We haven't had any, as I said, external funding. Yeah. There's really? No That's amazing. There's no V C there's cow. no um you know loan shark. It's all um, organic. The question is how much money to put back into the business, how much money right. to take as a salary. You know, a yeah. lot of I, I worked for a long time as, as my partners. You know, we didn't make any money. We were just building the business. You just pour it back into we, the business. That's what, yeah, we pour it back. And then slowly, you know, uh, it depends on, you know, it, we're still a small business. You know, we do a lot of sales. Uh, you know, cash was always an issue with companies like this, especially on these right. big deals. Right. And 
we're getting a little more advanced at it and more mature. Yeah. So it's definitely um, yeah. complicated, and I think that's another secret to our success to, that we were able to manage that with these different, yeah. different ways of funding and and reinvesting and keeping the overhead low and technology high. Yeah. Um, that was uh, pretty um, important to our growth. Yeah. Hey, Tom, that is amazing. That is truly amazing. So how do you keep everyone so disciplined? Because you could say for you, let's say, yeah, I'm just going to take a low salary, blah, blah, blah. But now you have three people, three founders that have to get on the same page that have to be that disciplined. What do you do yeah, from so, the beginning as all co-founders? So I was, um, well, Ari is older than me. Um, he was about... 32 or 3 when we started I was like 23 mm -hmm. and John was about 15 he was, like, <laughs> was he actually, really he wasn't 15 was he no he was he, he was, was really like, 15 yeah you should interview him wow that's amazing um, yeah he was 15 he was in high school and he was an intern holy cow and, and he started working like on all the vacations then he went to college at night and worked and now he's the president of the company Jeez. Um, so you know I don't know how many expense, much expenses he had then but he has a tremendous work ethic. You're right. Not He's many great. expenses so, in 15, so, yeah. Regardless, he you know, he, he just wanted something long-term and knew that, you know, he had the ability to focus on this now and right. build something for himself. Right. I had a little more, I had a family at other expenses, but, yeah. you know, we figured it out. And it's not always easy. It's usually not easy. Right. And even when you, as you know, even if you're a bigger or more successful company, there's always things that happen. You know, there's lots yeah. of vendors, there's potential issues, there's legal, you know. So it's always a struggle. It's always something, yeah. But it's always a, it's always a roller coaster. But, um, yeah, we, we don't really have um, yeah. uh, any major funding. It's all, it's all organic growth. Yeah. And I think sometimes it holds us back, honestly. I think if you want to take it to, like, the real next level, yeah. you know, like, really exponentially go, you need some kind of infusion. Yeah. And I've I've considered it, but yeah. I think for now we're we're on a good trajectory. So yeah. we'll we'll see how it plays out. What's your biggest uh, lesson or advice to someone who's kind of at where you are, like three years ago, um, as far as managing capital? Because it seems like you guys did a, a really good job doing that, considering you bootstrapped this company. Yeah, um, always watching costs. Uh, Building good relationships with the credit cards, making sure you pay on time, yeah. keeping your your own credit score good. Um, obviously, I have to have some kind of backup funding. I mean, thank God we didn't really have to rely on that, but you, sometimes you need to. Your deal goes bad, you know. Despite what I'm saying, you know, you know, we we've, we've right. definitely had had bumps in the road, like everyone, you know. Right. And sometimes those could really hurt you at this scale. Right. Um, but yeah, have good. Make sure your credit is great. Monitor your credit score. A lot of times your credit score will dip and the credit cards will, will cut you down without you even knowing. Um, Dun & Bradstreet is important. Building a good Dun & Bradstreet profile for your business. Listing all your vendors and having them you know, verify your prompt payment so you build almost like a community. Most of the distributors in our industry know each other so they ask about us. So just mm -hmm. good name, always mm -hmm. paying on time no matter what. Yeah. And if for some reason let's say you can pay, or there's a cash flow problem, you know, being very transparent. Oh, we had an issue, this and that, funds, uh, you know, obviously the truth. Um, just being open and honest, no right. games, no, right. just straight to the point. And uh, building relationships, with, you know, the different, you know, accounts payable people and just just growing slowly. So yeah. we, we've, got, we've got credit lines with some vendors just by paying on time and building our accounts that, that exceed yeah. any you know bank credit line that most companies would get. Yeah. Obviously, they have insurance on it, and you know there's some risk on their part. Right. But if you can get credit lines with hundreds of vendors and you add that together, right, that's a lot of money. Right. Um, that the, seems the, the to be the tricky part is to sell the product within 30 days when your payments due. Um, right. You have to stock the right product, and that yeah. goes back to my discussion about yeah. how much to order. Right. What was the biggest gamble? That you just you kind of knew this was going to sell a certain product, and you just you just bought a ton of it, and you knew you'd have to have to sell it in that thirty days to, to pay it back. Good question. Um, you know, I don't do a lot of the purchasing. 
Yeah. Actually, I don't really do the purchasing. Jonathan does the purchasing. I do a lot of the other. I do a lot of the other stuff. Um, I'm involved in the process and the software and the system. And right. I used to be more involved in finding the vendors and building the channel relationships. Yeah. But but John Goldman does most of the purchasing. He uh, when he was probably how old was he then? This is our old office. I think he was like eighteen or nineteen. Mm. We, there was a company, I don't want to, maybe I should mention the you name, don't but have to mention it, yeah. we would sell this, uh, it was like a mobile router where you could attach uh, like a, a wireless dongle so you can get, make a, a router out of a cellular, off of cellular. Okay. And um, it's a great product, very unique, nothing really like it. And we did very well on the new product. So they had decided to offer us some of the refurbished product, which was usually something I sh- shy away from, as I explained before, in several right. instances. Returns. But in this case, yeah. it was certified refurbished from the manufacturer. We actually went to the manufacturer, saw how they did it. It was tested. And he bought a very large amount because there was a minimum quantity needed for them to actually do it. If not, mm-hmm. they were like maybe throw it in the garbage or uh, you know just scrap it for parts or you know just sell it to some end user. Right. So we put a significant amount. Um, this is one risk that I, I totally trusted him with, and it was successful. Mm-hmm. And we tried to build a name for it. So, when someone could buy the cheapest mobile router you could buy, mobile broadband router, you could buy was like a hundred dollars. So this refurbished model was like fifty dollars. So mm. you, you kind of half the price. Your margin is not so great in the beginning, as it gains popularity on your website, on Amazon, and the channel. You could slowly raise it. So you. you you do all the process like you right. know, the tech armor guy. You build the reviews, you build the rating, and then you can command the higher price point. Right. And we basically built, and this is before we really knew exactly how to do stuff. We built this profile for this product to the point where we couldn't get enough of it. Mm. Just such high demand at that price point from carriers, from overseas, and it was it like it's exploded. A great problem. It exploded, and we we're making much higher margins because. Again, we were buying it at a risk. Yeah. So that was a, a really great success. Yeah. How do you word off competition? Because other people are probably looking at what you're doing if you're a leader it's in the space. Hard. It's very hard on some of these channels. Like people are doing the same things. Or yeah. if someone's sending a product to Amazon or selling on their website featured, you could do it too. So one way is we have these deep relationships with vendors where we get special opportunities, special buys. Yeah. Special SKUs, special kits. One way is, like I told you, in general, we try to do things differently. The support More side, support, yeah. the uh, training side, the government side, the branding, yeah. the team. All the things I mentioned are different. I think yeah. uh, John likes to say, I think um, we look at other people and we do we do the opposite. Right. Not 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 as if they don't know what they're doing, right. but we want to differentiate. You want to be different. Yeah, it's nice. It doesn't always work but usually it creates this unique um niche for for growth yeah and you know Anton, i want to talk about because you've done some amazing stuff with partnerships with asia europe south america um so i want to ask about that but first what were some of the challenges early on compared to today like when we were doing the like the the 4g type site yeah business? when you're doing yeah th- three guys in a cubicle yeah, it was more. Started, yeah, what were the biggest challenges was, then? And then guys, it was yeah, two, three two, guys in a yeah. cubicle. Uh, I mean, I still um, have this problem, you know, just delegating. So I mean, now I have people to delegate to. Thank God, really good people. Um, even though I like, I guess I'm not such a good delegator. I like to do things on my own, right. mostly because I never really had people I could trust to do it. Right. Well, so through the trial and error, I've learned to find those people, and that's the only way you can scale. Mm. That's important. So early on, just doing too much. So early on, I was like, I was working, you know, like very, very long hours. Yeah. And like, tell me, what's a typical day during that time? I mean, I mean, it was funny. You saw the growth, and you mentioned some of the numbers. But like the first year or two, we weren't really like producing any revenue. We were just kind of tinkering. Should we do this? Should we do that? We'll sell this on day. We'll work at this network. I was kind of learning the business. Right. And we were, like, calibrating. And then we found some models that worked and didn't, and we slowly built off of it. Mm-hmm. Then once we launched a website that did some ads, it was like, hey, we have something here. But we probably tried, I can't tell you how many other things we tried that failed. How many websites I've built um, or initiatives I've tried or people I've spoken to or vendors I've spoken to 
that just never ever worked. Mm -hmm. So working really hard to find something that sticks. You gotta try yeah. a lot of things. Yeah. And then even when you do those things, you have to go back and say, hey, which is the most efficient? So you don't spread yourself too thin. Because to me yeah. now, we're in a place where there is so much opportunity. And I think for everyone, there's so much opportunity. It's a question of focusing. And that's that's one of my biggest challenges. Mm -hmm. um, but thank God we're in a position where, you know, it's a good problem to have, let's say. Right. But there's still so much out there, and when you focus on one thing, you know, yeah. sometimes the other thing is give. Right. So in that instance, I was doing everything. I was doing finance, I was doing channels, I was doing development, I was doing partner relationships, and my partners were doing the same thing. We were all doing all that. Right. Slowly, we're trying to build an organization where all that's in place. So to go yeah. from that to what we have now is, right. when I look back, it's kind of uh, unbelievable. Yeah. But um, What was a typical day that your wife would kill you if you still had uh, today? Oh, you're saying... Uh, like you wake beginning. up, yeah. So I tell my wife, I'm like, you know, if I was a doctor and I was on call, you wouldn't mind. So why does it matter now? <laughs> She's like, because you're not making, you're not making any money. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I would work probably um, from like nine to seven, eight, nine. Mm -hmm. Then I go home, uh, try to see my kids in the morning. If not at night. Oh well, now I have three kids, so. Well. It's even harder, so I'm trying to make sure I see them at least once a day and the weekends. But sometimes I have to go in early or I'll leave early. It's it depends. But um, aside from that, I you know ever since smartphones came out, I'm very into gadgets and stuff. Like I was constantly working, so I wouldn't say 24 hours, but you, you know could, you're always, always attached. And whenever yeah. it's it's not it's not because I wanted to be or it was like a workaholic per se. I love to just chill out and go to a you know a Mets game like we we're talking about baseball before, mm -hmm. but I, like I was the only one who had the answers to some things because we were only like five or six people and the credit cards were in my name and this and that so I couldn't go on a trip or I couldn't go you know I went to Asia for some stuff and like I was getting called every four minutes like oh what about this what about this what about that right you know then we start documenting things and scaling things so it's very hard to. Um, <laughs> exist in that state. I mean, I liked it. I enjoyed it. But you burn out and definitely burned out a few times. And, you know, you reinvigorate yourself and try mm -hmm. to take, change things. Well, yeah, what do you do I when you burn out? Myself. What do I do when I burn out? Yeah, to um, get back. I think I haven't really, like, burnt out, like, you know. And I don't mean permanently. Yeah, I just mean, yeah. Uh, you know, I like, I like to travel. Um, I travel a lot. Or this year I actually did. And a few years ago, I did. When my kids were younger, I, I, I paused. But I think three years ago, I traveled like over three hundred thousand miles. Wow! So I was in Asia. I was in Panama. I was for in, business. I was at, so, yeah, yeah. Um, business development shows. A lot of it was learning, training, um, partnerships, meetings, setting up a European entity. Mm -hmm. oh, it's a lot. Um, maybe too much. It's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. I like it in the fact that like you kind of get away and you clear your head. I often get more done like out of the office than in the office because when you're in the office, you're a lot of distractions. You're just distracted by a lot, yeah. um, but you still have to be there for the FaceTime. Yeah. Um, so. So what's yeah, the biggest I, challenge today? Yeah. So I said sometimes I would take a vacation or two just to like clear my head. Right. You know, turn my phone off, not uh, not deal with it. Yeah. Sometimes maybe a little more anxious because I just you know didn't want to like. It would just make me think about it too much. Right. But I've learned to. I'm working on my. Uh, Detach a little bit. Life balance. Yeah. As we speak, so. Is it, if that exists, right? Yeah. Um, what's the biggest challenge today? For me. Yeah. Um. Probably. Or, probably. Probably the. Work-life balance. Um. You know, dealing with a lot of different personalities and people. You know the constant roller coaster of a business of well, let's say of this size that sometimes um, find the good talent. I think how important that is is very hard. Mm -hmm. Went a lot of people. Um, those are some of the big challenges. There's others for sure. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about the partnerships because it seems like you've done some amazing things. Gone out Asia, Europe, South America. What? Give me, I guess, an example of one of the ones you put together. How you know how you even found that specific you know company to creating this international deal for your company? 
Okay. Which was the hardest um, to to get into, country wise? Um. There's a couple of good examples. Um, yeah. One is, one was. I mean, it's not so uh, unique per se. But one of those, like when I was doing those larger wireless deals, like you know, six seven figure deals with yeah. three year turnaround time and foreign governments. Um, I had a deal in Central America that just took me. It's still going on. It's just like forever. Um, I, someone emailed me regarding products. We built a relationship. I went there and it just. One thing led to the next. We provided some solutions for them. That was more on the integration side. And it was quite, uh, it's still like a, a saga. A lot of these countries move very, very slow with procurement and budget and things like that. Um, another one is an example of a product that we found online. Um, it's a video streaming type product from Japan. And we reached out to the vendor. We saw they were selling it online, but there was no real presence. And it was selling very well in Japan, but not in the States because they didn't really understand. That's one of the other really interesting things we could do. Yeah. Aside from finding vendors who don't understand, finding foreign vendors who understand the U.S. landscape. Right. Um, in other countries, you know, people in Europe or Germany or even Japan, they, you know, product quality is very important. But like the packaging or the design doesn't matter. In the U.S., for whatever it's worth, people are very into design and looks and, mm -hmm. and it. I mean, that may be a little too much. Right. The product quality, they don't necessarily care as much about. Um, so convincing like a Japanese company that they have to make a box like this has to be clear what it does. The instructions have to be straightforward mm -hmm. to appeal to. You have to get into retail stores. You're giving you them a lot of feedback. Yeah, you have to pay for placement in a the store. They're not going to put it on the shelf, things that they don't know. They're like, what do you mean in Japan? We just post it on the blog and everyone buys it because we're so advanced. Right. So we're able to take their company... They were doing no sales and turned into millions of sales in the U.S. Was just you know that that Total tweaks, tweaks in the culture and the barrier. Now it's very difficult. It's very different cultures, very difficult. But that with that comes the, the opportunity. Yeah. And I have some European products. This was a product from Japan. Um, some of the Chinese stuff that we're trying to to manufacture. Same idea. Um, but uh, it doesn't come easy. Right. There's a lot of and hard work that's why i ask because i'm curious of what makes you decide to actually expand internationally when it is so much hard work and long right. sales cycle so, so some of these were just like i went to different shows in different places trying to find differentiation in the market i don't want to be like a me too sell the same product what if i could bring a different product into the states um on the flip side which i didn't really mention before a lot of the products that we carry or have exclusives on for vendors, we sell that overseas. So we sell in Europe, and we have warehouses in UK and in Central Europe, and looking into South America and Australia and Japan and, and, and New Canada and Mexico, all those things. So the reason is, and I, I think I wrote it in uh, some of my notes that we were speaking about before, is because you have to be different in that way. So we mentioned being different channels. We mentioned being different upsells, cross-sells customer service, culture, coming full circle here. Um, yeah. What if I'm the only one selling this in the UK? What if I'm the only one selling this in Germany? What if I have a different spin on it? What if I could translate my listings, provide international shipping at a low cost, um, provide landed VAT and duties with different softwares so people will buy, um, mail forwarding addresses to people who would never want to buy from the US, but now... They have a consolidator. Uh, eBay did that with global shipping. You could sell to a product, you could sell to a customer. You ship it to Kentucky, and they forward it on. You don't have to worry about any of the international. Spent a lot of time figuring out all the headaches of shipping internationally, and selling internationally. Whether you're setting up a an entity or you're an importer, there's different thresholds. Europe is very complicated. Um, the next big thing is is China. Yeah. As you know, Alibaba is like you know seven. Know, seven, three, four times the size of Amazon, eBay, and another combined. Although it's not the easiest country. To try, I've been there. It's not the easiest country to to deal with or be successful in. It's very different. Although there's so many people and they're all getting internet. And believe it or not, we could sell a product in China, a product that's made in someone's backyard in China, 
I could buy it, produce it, buy it from a distributor, ship from China to the U.S., then ship it back to China and sell it to an end user on Alibaba or Taobao for less than they would buy it in the mall wow. down their block. Wow. And there's not people... People are starting to capitalize on it. And that was that global show that I went to. It was all about that. Think global. Think global, yeah. yeah. All about that. South America, the, the this e-commerce craze, everyone with the mobile phones. But the reason I do it, you ask me, like, why or how? Like, that's what differentiates you. If you spend mm-hmm. three months understanding taxes and duties and have different fines and issues and legal, and you're the first to market and you do all the hard work, I wouldn't say you definitely succeed, but you have a better chance. Yeah, and then a, once everyone figures it out, you're already three steps ahead. There's a larger barrier to entry there. So yeah, I did a lot of research and planning for that, and now we're kind of revamping all our systems to capitalize on all that we we know, mm-hmm. even though it changes every day. Right. On a high level, to capitalize on what we know to be successful and and different. Yeah. So we've talked a lot about a lot of things here. Um, yeah. Just to wrap up. What are some of the milestones um, that you're proud of, that you've hit? Good question. Um, well, I told you we were kind of tinkering in the beginning. But once we kind of figured out what we were doing, yeah. we grew over 100% for like three years in a row. So we went from, let's say... Uh, 300,000 to 3 million to 6 to 12 to 24 amazing, yeah. consecutively. Um, uh, and we made the Inc. 500 fastest growing companies right. for three years in a row. Um, we also made the Internet Retailer Top 500 the last two years, which was great. Um, that, that GSA schedule, which we're trying to build out, was another biggie, yeah. the government contract. Yeah. As, as a milestone. Um, what else? Um, I think on a high level, just being able to you know, really have nice software systems and integrations and outsourcing warehousing and getting rid of a lot of the manual random systems and putting in real processes and procedures yeah. for hiring, for protocol, for workflow. It's something that we're very proud of and we're continuing to improve upon. And it's very important uh, for continued growth. Yeah. What makes you decide? And I'm always curious because people have such differing uh, strategies or or ways to handle this. What makes a company decide to release numbers, like be very public with numbers, like go on the ink ink list and release their numbers, as opposed to not? Because obviously that was a conscious decision that you made. Yeah. Well. well- yeah, I mean, to be on that list, you need to submit your financials. Right. Obviously, not everyone on, you know, it says you're the number 50th fast-growing company. You're number one in telecommunications, which was actually what we were. Um, you know, obviously, there may be a company that's much bigger that just doesn't want to, don't want to be out there. Some people right. want to be out there and get the publicity or the good that comes with it. And some mm-hmm. people just are quiet about it strategically for vendors or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, it's important to show growth and to show that you're successful and growing. Obviously, you know, there's a lot of companies on that list that may not really be so profitable just because they're growing. It's not just about top line. Right. It's about bottom line, and that's the kind of thing that we're working to improve now, especially in e-commerce. Just to touch on what you said before, most people don't realize if they're making money, how much money they're making, all these different fees and overheads and services. It's not like a mm-hmm. traditional business where you can really understand that. That's so straightforward so all the time. Variables, yeah. especially with the channels and the fees they take and the fulfillment charges and the taxes and the state taxes and the and the chargebacks, it's 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 like a jungle. Yeah. Uh, so being able to be profitable uh, and you know, these with these longevity models and not these just quick sales um, is a big milestone, I think. And we continue to work at that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess it gives confidence in the vendors and all the people who do business with you. That's a big factor. Yeah, for sure. So it's important to divulge for that. Obviously, you know, I don't, I mean, if you're a public company, you have to show everyone your profit and loss and balance sheet. Obviously, there's things that are, that are private, you know, our sales number, maybe not, you know, mm-hmm. most people understand that 
there's a lot of companies, you know, Amazon does billions of dollars, but they're not profitable, but they're right. still worth a lot of money. I mean, there's so many variables in it. Right. It's not really a straightforward question. Like, a, it's, you know, it's it's a multifaceted question. Mm-hmm. Um, it definitely helped the, the, you know, the buzz around us. I think now that we're leveled off, it's not as needed because we're kind of established to a certain extent. But, right. then, you know, yeah. you know this, this and all these other publicity, you know, helps because... It, you know, it's just good to get the word out for sure. Mm-hmm. Hey, Tom, I have one last question. And I you know, really appreciate your time and expertise with this. I know you speak at conferences um, and you're going to be doing a lot of speaking too and you go to a lot of conferences. But um, first, before I ask, where should people find you, your website or social media? Um, yes, our website is uh, quantum-co.com. That's our corporate website. Mm-hmm. Um, you could check out my LinkedIn. It's uh, LinkedIn.com. I think it's slash my name, Search Eitan Wiener. E Y T A N W I N E R. Feel free to connect. Ask me any questions. Um, you could send me an email as well. It's just E Y T A N at quantum dash code dot com. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm happy to be in touch and help anyone in the e-commerce world or in the business world, if I, if I can, in my uh, with whatever I, I've learned, I'm still pretty young and uh, learning a lot every day. Yeah. Um, and I have a Twitter account now. That's actually new. You've grown up. At <laughs> Aton Wiener, U I T A N W I E N E R. Um, you can find me on Skype. You could find mm-hmm. me on Facebook. You but you have three kids, so you don't want too a lot many. Of other things. You have three kids in a company, so you don't want too many people contacting you. But um, what's last question, Aton, is what's top of mind now? What do you think? What do you see is going to help the most growth in the future for the company? Um, it's hard to put my finger on it, but the government and this B two B play. Where we diversify more from e-commerce and have that as a big part of our revenue, I think is going to be huge. It's a huge sector. It's underdeveloped. There's a lot of need for product. The technology within the procurement is kind of old. And we're trying to bring a new edge to it. So I want that to be a lot of our new business. You know, I think a lot of people could do what we're doing, even though we do it a certain way. But this is more proprietary in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, and hopefully, you know, some of our private label and our own branded stuff and licensed stuff and mm-hmm. things like that yeah um i think will lead to the growth and then the idea is hopefully you know as we hone in on the model helping vendors sell product and you know sometimes you rise to a situation where you know you can acquire such a vendor or you can acquire some e-commerce and just run up the same funnel that we do so instead of selling electronics we're selling um uh, sportswear, but it's the same model. Mm-hmm. You know, online is just a widget. Obviously, you have to understand the market, but it's probably easier description-wise to sell uh, sweatpants than uh, right. a firewall. Uh, <laughs> right. Let's say acquiring companies, um, using some of our proprietary technology and tools as a service. You know, Amazon uh, makes more money on their AWS hosting service than their retail business. Right, I was reading about that. They yeah. have the hosting services because they needed it for the retail business. So through all of our development we've created a lot of proprietary tools that would really benefit other sellers uh, from the logistics side to the auditing shipping to uh i could list like 50 things if i I had to yeah so that's another thing that we're looking into yeah not getting too spread thin yeah yeah what have you learned most from your other co-founders what have I learned most? Yeah. Like, I mean, obviously people have mentors that they um, learn a lot of lessons from, get advice from, and you have co-founders, whether it's a co-founder or a mentor. Yeah, I mean, we're all, we're all different uh, personalities. Yeah. Um, I guess perseverance, um, you know, kind of like pushing forward no matter what type of attitude. Like, we're going to succeed. We're going to be different. We're going to not take shortcuts. Kind of the things I told you was a lot of molded by just being together a lot of learning from what was wrong mm-hmm. or or doing wrong um, you know traveling going out to meet people Skype is great I like this is really cool you know but I think like meeting you in person which hopefully I'll do one day is yeah. more 
important just right. shaking someone's hand that you lose that personal touch um i learned that from my partners as well yeah. um now more you know that we're more mature like you know setting up structures procedures policies documenting things mm -hmm. more like a corporate company than just yeah. you know Winging some it. kids kids yeah. which which we were and we're we're growing up so we're focusing on that and learning that uh as well and we're able to hopefully adapt to such uh challenges yeah. but they're, they're those are some of the things yeah Hey, Tom, this has been fantastic. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you so much. Well, Paul, thank you for having me.